Today I want to speak to you on the subject of five things you need to know about the number 666. Now, if you're uh, absolutely new to the Bible, uh, perhaps you've only heard of 666 in movies and uh, various world applications, but it actually comes from the book of Revelation and the 13th chapter, which is where we're going to begin reading in just a moment. And this, of course, is not going to be a complete or exhaustive study on the prophetic subject of the mark of the beast and the number 666. But I've had questions that have been coming in, and I sat down uh, over the past several days, and I've tried to put together a study that addresses what I believe to be the five most important things that you need to understand about 666. Let's go to Revelation 13 and let me show you in the Bible uh, where we find this reference. Revelation chapter 13 beginning to read at verse 11 and we're going to read down through verse 18. As always, thank you to our faithful students around the world. If you're not already, subscribe to our YouTube and podcast channel. I understand that that really helps the channel and helping to get the message and the gospel out across the world. So please subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you'll be ready for all of our content that we usually post, uh, depending on my schedule, usually twice a week. Revelation chapter 13, beginning to read at verse 11, reading down through verse 18, Then I saw another beast come up out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. Pause right here, and for sake of time I'm addressing the passage that brings us into a revelation of that mystery number 666. But in Revelation chapter 13, for the first time in all of human history, we have a revelation of what I oftentimes call the unholy trinity. And the unholy trinity, when you're reading Revelation 13, the first beast is the Antichrist. The second beast is the false prophet. It'll be like his demonic vice president, as it were. And then the dragon is Satan. And so just to give you a little bit of context as we read and study this mysterious number, 666, just write that down in your notes. The unholy trinity in Bible prophecy is Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. They are first revealed in Revelation 13. Let's read on, verse 12. He exercised all the authority of the first beast, and he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down to earth from the sky while everyone was watching. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, He deceived all the people who belong to this world. Pause again. Uh, Anytime we're teaching on Bible prophecy, I always encourage those that are serious students, always highlight in your studies on Bible prophecy the word deceive, deceived, and deception. It is one of the most significant themes and tools that the demonic influences of political corruption, the Bible teaches us, will use in the last days. And so as students of the Bible, usually when I come across those words, deceive, deception, deceived, I ask you to highlight it because if you do that consistently in your study of the Bible, you're going to see that it is dominant throughout end time prophecy. He deceived all the people who belong to this world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. He then permitted to give life to this statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone refusing to worship it must die. 
talk about severe mandates, you talk about governmental overreach, you have not seen anything like the world will be exposed to during the tribulation period that is to come. The government of the world, and it will be a one world government with a one world leader, will enforce their mandates with the death penalty for all who dare rebel. Verse 16, He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Highlight that. The number representing his name. This is one of the biblical clues as we're going to learn today. Verse 18, wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Let's take a moment to pray together. And as we pray, uh, those of you who are studying, there are always some who uh, write me or in the comment section will say, this is the very first video that I've seen of yours. This is the very first study that I have sat in upon. And many of you that watch are in various places. Some of you have no understanding as to what Bible prophecy is. Some of you perhaps have never had anyone lovingly tell you that you can have a right relationship with God. And above all, everything that we do in this ministry, Lost Lamb Association, Everything points towards one main objective, and that is to help men and women and boys and girls understand what does it mean to have a right relationship with God. And so if you do not have a right relationship with God, in other words, are you living in victory over sin or is sin living in victory over you? There is a power in Christ that can break both the curse of sin and the chains of sin and set you free and give you a brand new opportunity to live in the fullness of God's favor and forgiveness and blessing. And so I'm going to ask you to be patient because at the very end of the study, if you're not sure if you have a right relationship with God, if you've never personally or publicly repented of sin and turned your back on sin and turned your heart to God, I want to afford you that opportunity at the very end. And so can I kindly ask you to be patient because several of you today need to pray with me about that very matter. Let's pray and ask God's blessing over the study. Father, once again, as we open up the Holy Bible, we humble our hearts before you we turn to you and ask for the help and for the guidance, the wisdom, the anointing of the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. I pray for every single person who's listening and the thousands who will listen in the days and weeks ahead that they might feel the presence and the power of God and know that every word in the Bible is true and the content of Bible prophecy validates that as we study this mysterious number that the Bible calls 666. Help me to communicate in a way to make all of these things clear and we ask it in Jesus precious name and all God's people said Amen. Uh, there have been many theologians throughout church history that have written and uh, done their best to solve the mystery of the number 666 that's found here in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18. And sadly, uh, many of them have grossly misused and mistaught on this number 666. And, uh, and what I mean by that is I frequently see and not just recently, throughout my entire lifetime and ministry of over four decades, and even before I'm sure I was born, this has gone on, 
but the gross misuse of this passage is oftentimes used to try to identify some current world leader and uh, the attempt obviously is to apply the number 666 or to do some type of mathematical equation to show who they believe the Antichrist to be. And I've heard I don't know how many trying to identify through sermons and lectures and social media almost every time some significant world leader is involved in something nefarious that comes up and people try to tie it to Bible prophecy and, and you'll find someone saying, the Lord revealed to me this man is the Antichrist. And I've heard uh, Mikhail Gorbachev called the Antichrist, John F. Kennedy. Uh, I've heard people try to identify him as the Antichrist because of the fatal wound that the Antichrist will be miraculously raised up from a fatal head wound. Well, it's not years later. It's shortly after his wound, but I've heard John F. Kennedy explained in various sermons as being the potential Antichrist, Henry Kissinger, Ronald Reagan, Bill Gates. I mean, I could go on ad nauseum. And one of the things that I want you to understand is that any attempt, don't miss this, any attempt to try to take Revelation 13 and verse 18 and do theological gymnastics to try to put uh, the number 666 upon a current world leader and identify him as the Antichrist is simply poor scholarship. And uh, I don't mean to be harsh, but I would strongly encourage you to stay away from any ministry that dabbles in that type of perversion of text and perversion of biblical meaning. Let me just say it right up front. There is no way to specifically and accurately identify who the Antichrist is. Now, do I believe that he's alive and well? Uh, I actually do. From what I know on the chronology of Bible prophecy, I believe strongly that the Antichrist could be hiding in the wings or maybe openly out there in some position of leadership that will one day escalate him to that man called the Antichrist. But you will never hear me point a finger and say so and so is the Antichrist because he'll not be revealed until after the rapture. Uh, we'll come back to that. So if you're taking notes in today's study, I would like to show you what I believe to be five of the most important fundamental things that we do know from Scripture about this number of prophetic mystery, 666, the number of a man, and that man is the Antichrist. Now again, this is not intended to be an exhaustive study of everything we know about the number 666 as found in the Bible, but five that I believe are the most fundamental for all students of the Bible. So if you're taking notes, number one, the meaning of 666. Because the Bible does give us clues. And to properly understand the meaning of 666, you have to first understand at least a thumbnail of biblical numerology. For example, the number seven in the Bible is connected to God throughout the scriptures. And it's important that you understand that. And the number seven connected with God is because it always represents perfection, completeness, and wholeness. Be sure to put that in your notes. When you read through your Bible, the number seven is always connected to God and it represents wholeness, completeness, and perfection. And by the way, both spiritual and physical. Because in the Hebrew, the number seven has the exact same number of consonants as the word for completeness or wholeness. Seven derives much of its meaning from being tied directly 
to the story of creation in the first book of, of the Bible, the book of Genesis. In the story of creation in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, we read that on the seventh day, God rested. On the seventh day, God rested. Again, it speaks of perfection, completeness, wholeness. God had completed creation. The number seven is found 735 times in your Bible. And if we were to include seventh or sevenfold, that number goes up uh, by over a hundred. But the number seven is found 735 times in your Bible. And as we read and study the book of Revelation, what we're using today is our uh, our text, the number seven, do you know how many times it's found in the book of Revelation in 22 chapters? 54 times. The number seven is found in the book of Revelation. In Revelation we read of God's great wrath and judgment that is clearly prophesied that will soon come upon this ungodly world. Uh, these judgments are seen in seven seals, uh, seven trumpets, seven bowls. Uh, the Bible speaks in Revelation of seven thunders, etc. We find it in the Bible 54 times in the book of Revelation. Now, why do I establish the number seven in connection with God, with perfection, with it being throughout the entirety of the biblical narrative? Because to understand what 666 represents, you must first understand the significance of the number seven. The Antichrist, this coming one world leader, Revelation tells us he is going to openly claim that he is God. He's not just going to claim to be a world leader. He's not just going to claim to be an answer to world political, uh, geopolitical, economic, etc. problems. He's going to literally claim to be God. There'll be no mistaking during the seven-year tribulation period who the Antichrist is. He will not just be a unique political leader that stands head and shoulders above the rest. He'll be the only one on the planet who is blatantly claiming, I am God. If the Antichrist were indeed God, then his number should be 777, but it is not, because he is not God. You see, if we were to do a study of numerology, and that's not the focus of today's study, you've learned today that in biblical numerology, seven is connected with God, uh, right from the very beginning in the story of creation and throughout the scriptures, 54 times in the book of Revelation, over 700 times in the Bible, but Man's number in the Bible is six. Six in the Bible speaks of man. It speaks of carnality. It speaks of that which is lesser than seven. The number of man is six. God created man on the sixth day of creation. Man was created by God. Man, listen, man is a creation he is not the creator. So six represents man. It represents falling short of perfection and wholeness. Six represents that you are not deity. You will always be short of deity. And for this reason, the number of the Antichrist, 666 in the Bible, is a clear indication, first of all, that he claims to be God, but he is not God. He is merely a fallen man pretending to be God. Uh, I'm not going to uh, go down the road of numerology, but I will just state this. I've always found it interesting that the number of the name Jesus in Greek is 888, but that's for another study. So number two, the mark is a literal, visible mark. 
the 666 mark connected with this man who is identified by the number 666 is a literal, visible mark. So in your notes, number two, 666, the mark of the beast will be a literal, visible mark. Note that verse 16 is translated, given a mark on. Now for some of you that have Bibles uh, that were translated before uh, probably the 1800s or so, uh, you may find the word a mark in, but that is an incorrect rendering of the original uh, Greek text. Uh, The King James Bible uh, translates the mark in, but the Greek word is epi. And epi in the Bible always means on or external. And some would say, well, isn't that just a a minor detail? No, it's actually quite significant. Because if the mark of the beast were in the skin, that allows for it being under the skin, that allows for it being a different type of technology that's not visible, then it would not be seen. So it is a vitally important point that the Bible says from the original Greek word epi, E-P-I, always translated properly on or upon. Very important in your understanding of this part of Bible prophecy in this part of the book of Revelation. 666, the mark of the beast, whatever that will be, we do not not we do not yet know, will be visible. It'll not be hidden. It'll not be on a credit card or a smart watch or in your cell phone. It will be on a mark, a stamp, engraved, branded. All of those words would be properly connected to the Greek word epi. Which, by the way, that is why all modern accurate translations, and not all translations of the Bible are accurate. Uh, If you're a new student, at some point, listen to our Bible study on which translation of the Bible is the most accurate. Because not all modern translations are accurate. They're, They're not all full translations. For example, one of the very popular translations of the Bible right now is called the Passion Bible. Uh... I wouldn't own one. I wouldn't give one away. It's not a proper translation. It is terrible. It was actually written by one man who doesn't even have the scholarship to do so. But I'm not on that subject today. But I'm just wanting you to be clear on this. 666, the mark of the beast from the Greek, epi, is on. It is a visible, literal mark. The Bible states that the mark of the beast will be placed either upon a person's forehead or upon the back of the right hand. And that is going to take place during the seven-year tribulation period. Number three, the mark 666 will be given as a sign of devotion to the Antichrist. The mark of the beast, 666, will be given as a sign of devotion to the Antichrist. Many people speak of the mark uh, and they refer to it in their biblical teaching and in their theological lectures and the emphasis is usually placed upon it is a one world cashless society technology. Now that's accurate. But that is not the main reason for the mark of the 666 that we find in Revelation chapter 13. Actually, the Bible tells us that it's twofold. Uh, Look at Revelation 13 and verse 12. He exercised all the authority of the first beast, and he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. The purpose of 666, the mark of the beast, 
is twofold. And if you're taking notes, the mark of the beast, 666, its purpose is twofold. Number one, it is a mandated cashless economic system that will be severely enforced. The Bible said people that rebel will be put to death. There'll be no exception for that. There'll be no quarantine for 14 days or uh, not able to travel or uh, locking down bank accounts. None of that play stuff. You will either submit to this global corrupt demonic leader or the Bible says that you will be put to death and many will be beheaded. The Bible says that all who refuse the mark and by the way, Revelation chapter 7 speaks of the greatest revival the world has ever seen. Did you know that the greatest revival the world has ever seen has not yet happened and will not happen before the rapture? It happens after the rapture. Revelation 7 tells us, I saw a great multitude that no man could number. And of course, I have studies on that. I hope you've listened to them. If not, put it on your list of things to do. But Revelation 7 speaks of a mass number. No one could even number it that are saved. These are tribulation saints. These are not church age believers. Church age believers have already been raptured. The rapture is the next major prophetic event. After the rapture, we enter into, according to Revelation, a seven year period of time called the Great Tribulation, or perhaps a better theological term is the Tribulation. Because if I were teaching this in a seminary or a Bible college, I would point out the distinction that the first half of the Tribulation is three and a half years in length, and the second half is an escalated, much worse, a apocalyptic escalation of judgment and wrath. And so theologically, if you want to be proper about it, the entire seven years is called the tribulation period. And the last half, the last three and a half years is the great tribulation. Now, I'm not going to uh, correct anybody that calls it the great tribulation. Some of my great heroes in the faith that I grew up listening to referred to it always in their books. Uh, wrote it as the Great Tribulation. But if you want to uh, properly use it, it's the Tribulation period, seven years. The last half of the Tribulation is called the Great Tribulation. Jesus said if God had not shortened the days, none would survive. So again, 666, the mark of the beast, though we don't know exactly what it is, it will be implemented and by force, all put to death who rebel. And the Bible says that all those who are saved during the tribulation, they're called the tribulation saints, they refuse the mark of the beast and are beheaded. So the mandates are going to be like nothing the world has ever seen because they're not going to be regionally enforced. They're going to be globally enforced by some type of wicked military power that will carry out uh, these horrible deeds. Secondly, and more importantly, the mark of the beast 666 is a permanent and visible sign that you have pledged your life and sworn your allegiance to the global control of the Antichrist. And let me make this point clear. No one is going to take the mark of the beast accidentally. All will take the mark of the beast 666. The mark is identified with the man. I hope I've made that clear as we've been teaching on this. I begin with that point that the 666 is the number of a man. But though it is the number of the man that will identify this one world leader, the Antichrist, that same number that identifies the Antichrist as a man will identify his mark. Number four, we're talking about the five most important things I feel every Bible student needs to understand about the number 666. Number four, the 666 mark of the beast will not be revealed until halfway through 
the tribulation. Let me repeat that. The 666 mark of the beast will not be revealed until halfway through the tribulation. I don't know how to make this any clearer than I'm about to make it. The mark of the beast does not yet exist, exclamation point. I know that might offend several who have preached it and taught it and identified it. And, you know, I heard some guy recently on YouTube saying it was Apple smartwatch and trying to tie this technology. Stay away from such shallow scholarship, please. The mark of the beast is not revealed until halfway through the tribulation. So anybody trying to tell you what the mark of the beast is, is a poor scholar. And they shouldn't be on your list of people that you trust when you open your Bible. Find people who give you the scriptures without fear of men and translate the scriptures and interpret scriptures properly and say what the Bible says and refuse to say what the Bible doesn't say. Since the mark of the beast is not implemented until halfway through the tribulation, I'm going to say it one more time, the mark of the beast does not yet exist. A literal reading of the Old Testament book Daniel, and by the way, if you're a new student of the Bible, Daniel is perhaps one of the major prophetic books in the Old Testament that somewhat walks hand in hand with the book of Revelation in the New Testament. And there are other, time, uh, other end time books in the Bible that speak of Bible prophecy. But when you study these books, Daniel, Revelation, other prophecy texts and contexts, one of the things that you're going to learn is there is a very specific schedule for the unfolding of these end time events. The mark of the beast cannot exist until the beast himself is in power during the tribulation. Now to me that's just common sense, but yet I hear so many uh, teachings trying to identify uh, the Antichrist and trying to identify the mark of the beast and trying to uh, identify certain tattoos and RFID chips and on and on and on. The mark of the beast does not yet exist. And it cannot exist until the Antichrist is revealed and that will not take place until after the rapture of the church. Please put what I'm about to say into your notes. All believers in the church age, we are now living in the church age. If you've not heard me teach on the church age, Jesus prophesied in Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church age is a specific time in biblical, not just history, but currently and continuing. It began with the first advent of Christ. When Christ came to the earth, he was the conception form of the church, but it was inaugurated in Acts chapter 2 when they were empowered by and filled with the Holy Spirit. This initial group of believers who had gathered in the upper room in obedience to the teaching of Christ became the actual embodiment of the Spirit-filled church. And so the conception of the church actually was with the first advent of Christ it was inaugurated in Acts chapter 2 with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, filling believers with Holy Spirit power, and it will continue until the rapture of the church. After the rapture of the church, we who are in Christ are gone from this earth. So listen very carefully when I tell you this. All believers who now live in the church age will never have an opportunity to receive the mark of the beast. There is absolutely no way, if you are a born-again believer, you have repented of sin, 
you have received Jesus Christ, you have placed your faith and trust in the cross and the shed blood, you are a born-again believer by biblical terms. Living in Christ, in the church age, you will never have an opportunity. I repeat, you will never have an opportunity to choose the mark of the beast. So there's nothing anyone can get today to take or to receive the mark of the beast. I know people that basically are withdrawing from society, almost becoming escapist in their theology and, and you know, building bunkers and hideaways. And that's not what the church age is supposed to do. I don't have any problem with people living off grid. I'd love to have a few hundred acres off grid, but not for the sake of hiding, for the sake of hunting. I would love to have some beautiful property here in Maine that Judy and I and Biscuit could escape to when I need a little R&R &R and, &R and Judy needs some R&R. &R. I'd love to have a place where I wouldn't see a single person like God created the earth yesterday, but not for the purposes of hiding, for the purposes of fishing and relaxing and, and hunting. And uh, if uh, hunting offends you, pray for me that God will deliver me and set me free. And just for the record, beef doesn't grow on styrofoam at the grocery store. But I will say this, there are a lot of modern believers who are adopting an escapist mentality and, and they're trying to hide. The gospel needs to be proclaimed, not hidden. But I want every believer who's listening to me to know there is nothing anyone can do today or until the rapture takes place. Throughout the church age, the mark of the beast will never be available. I've made that clear on multiple levels. The mark of the beast will never be available, never be known during the church age. The mark of the beast cannot exist without the beast, and the beast, uh, the Antichrist, won't even reveal that until halfway through. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, he begins the tribulation with peace. He begins the tribulation, Daniel 9, 27, by signing a peace treaty with Israel in Jerusalem. And the world comes together in an organized peace, orchestrated, by this one world leader who will exalt himself eventually and come out as God halfway through the tribulation, the desecration of the temple. He will declare himself to be God and at that point he begins to enforce this one world cashless economic system which we've learned the mark of the beast 666 is twofold. It's not just an economic system that's imposed upon the world, mandated upon the world for all transactions. It is also a willing acceptance publicly that you fully accept and align with and pledge your allegiance to the Antichrist. Now, while current technology and methods of identifying and locating people uh, I'm not denying that this foreshadows what the Antichrist is going to do. I'm just saying that no specific technology that exists in the world today should ever be identified by any decent scholar or decent preacher or decent Bible teacher or decent theologian and telling you this technology is the mark of the beast. I'll just take it one step further. Anybody that teaches that or insists that should be deleted from your list of trusted Bible teachers. No one can specifically say what the technology will be until it is brought to bear. Lastly, and I close with this, number five. Those who take the mark, 666, will be eternally doomed. Now let me bring a few things into clarity as we're preparing to close our study today. I hope that you have put down in your notes that 666 is the number of a man. So somehow the Antichrist will be identifiable by 666. It is quite probable that his name or something that is connected with his name 
will be easily identifiable after the rapture with the prophecy, the number of a man, 666. You know, I remember when uh, Ronald Reagan was president and people were trying to say that he was the Antichrist because Ronald is six letters, his middle name Wilson was six letters, his last name Reagan was six letters. And people were saying, you know, well, that's easily identifiable. Ronald Reagan is the Antichrist. Well, let me just tell you that through uh, numerology and mathematical equations, you can pretty much take anybody's name and uh, come up with 666, as I've already stated. There are all kinds of theological gymnastics that have been used through the years to try to identify world leaders. But somehow the Bible seems to give us a clue that the Antichrist will be easily identified by the number 666. So it's quite probable that those who are saved during the tribulation, the reason why they refuse to take his mark is because they have identified who he is. Where did they find the courage to die? Where did they find the courage to be martyred? Where did they find the courage to be beheaded for their faith in Christ? The tribulation saints of Revelation 7 that were saved during the tribulation. Where did they find this incredible courage? It is quite probable, and this is not just my view, this is uh, fairly common among notable scholars. It is quite probable that this number of a man, which is one of the clues given to us in Revelation 13, he will be easily identifiable by the number 666. I don't think there's going to be somebody from MIT coming up with some unique math equation that a small percentage of the world can figure out. I believe the clues that we have, the five clues in Revelation 13, that's another study, but I believe those five clues make it quite probable that he will be easily identified by the number 666. And then it is the number of a man, and as we've learned today, it will be the number of his mark. Somehow connected to that mark, we've learned that the mark is visible, it is literal, it is identifiable from the Greek epi, it is upon the skin, either upon the forehead or upon the back of the hand, it will also be easily identifiable. And the Bible says anyone who takes the mark, and it will be willing, people who receive the mark will do it gladly. Why? The Bible says they'll be deceived. Many of them are going to believe this is God. Many will believe this is the promised Messiah. Many will believe this is the one we've been looking for. Many will believe this is the chosen one. But mark it in your notes, all who take the mark of the beast will do it willingly. And when they do, their fate is sealed, they are eternally damned. Where do we see that? Uh, go over to Revelation chapter 14, just one chapter over, and go down to verse 9 and 10. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 and 10, Then a third angel followed them, shouting, Anyone who worships the beast, and his statue, or who accepts his mark on the forehead or on the hand, must drink the wine of God's anger. It has been poured full strength into God's cup of wrath. And they, who? All who take the mark. They will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. So the Bible's clear on this. There's no wiggle room. All who take the mark will spend their eternity in hell. Once the mark is taken, there is no redemption, there is no forgiveness, there is no restoration. The Bible states clearly, all who take the mark, worship the beast, they will face the wrath of God poured out in full and their eternity is hell and fire and torment. Now the Bible states that the mark uh, will be the number 666 or uh, 
Uh, perhaps the numerical value of the Antichrist name, again, if the Bible doesn't say it, we can't make dogma or doctrine out of it. But I believe the five clues of Revelation 13 seem to indicate that most likely the Antichrist will be easily identified by the number 666. So in our study today, I've tried to share with you and uh, hope you'll listen to it again and again until you have it, uh, not just in your head, but also in your heart. Because one of the great reasons for studying and learning Bible prophecy is it keeps a fresh fire in your motivation to live holy and to live ready to meet the Lord. And if you're not ready to meet the Lord, I'm not judging you. I actually would like to be your best friend. I want to help you. If you're the worst sinner listening to me right now in the entire world, there is no sin in your life greater than the grace of God. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, Tiff, what if I've committed the unpardonable sin? If you have any spiritual desire or concern whatsoever, that is the number one evidence that you've not committed the unpardonable sin. When you get a chance, listen to our Bible study on what is the unpardonable sin. But the fact that you're listening, the fact that you're interested, is evidence that God's speaking to you, calling to you. Why don't you come home today? You can avoid all of what is coming. You can avoid the tribulation period. You can avoid all of the wrath and judgment of God that will be poured out over those seven years. You can avoid this corrupt system, this one world leader, one world government, one world economic system, one world religion, one world military. You can avoid all of that by receiving Christ while there is yet time. How can you know you're right with God? Number one, you have to recognize your sin. Number two, you have to repent of your sin. Number three, you have to receive Jesus Christ, God's only Son. I'm going to ask you to pray with me, and when we're done, I want you to go to our website, lostlamb.org, it's on the screen, and click on New Beginnings. And then I want you to go to our YouTube channel and subscribe and click on the playlist, New Beginnings. There are several teachings there that I've made just for those of you who are praying the sinner's prayer for the first time or maybe coming back home after a long time. We care about you. You can begin a new walk with Christ today. Pray with me. Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, I believe you were speaking to me. And down deep in my heart, I want to be ready to meet the Lord. I recognize my sin. All have sinned and fallen short of your holiness and your glory. I trust in Jesus Christ, your only Son. In childlike faith, I repent of sin. I turn my back on sin. And I turn my heart to Jesus today. With the blood that was shed, wash me, cleanse me, make me holy in your eyes. I receive salvation by faith and make you my Lord. And my Savior, I vow today to serve you. In place of my weakness, fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me your power. Keep me ready for your soon return. Today I'm saved, healed, delivered, set free, blessed by your favor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.